So next up on the program is Jessica Ward-Jones, who is going to speak about the impacts of pest animals on the lower reaches of the Snowy River. Jessica lives in Canberra and spends quite a bit of her time in the Kosciuszko National Park. She's a keen hiker, skier and horse rider. Uh, she's got a passion for biodiversity and conservation and wilderness areas and undertook her honours at ANU in the field of landscape ecology. She, has, she now works for the Snowy Mountains Engineering Corporation in ecological assessment, impacts assessments all over New South Wales and the ACT and she's continuing her honours work into a Masters of Research at ANU. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so hi, I'm Jess. Um, thank you for having me. Um, let me see where I am. So yeah, I'm a Masters by Research student, but I'm here today um, to share with you some of my research um, that was looking at impacts of pest animals um, on a catchment system in the snowy. Um, so yeah, I'm here today on behalf of Richard Swain and the Invasive Species Council. Um, and here it goes. Okay, so you guys are probably pretty familiar with the area, but my research sites um, were focusing, is that okay? <laughs> uh, focusing down on the Bayadbo and the Pilot Wilderness areas, um, looking at the catchment areas um, and the steep slopes that flow into the snowy. Um, so this forest um, is dominated by the Calytris uh, white cypress pine and the eucalyptus albans um, forest. Um, this forest is actually quite a unique occurrence. It's the only occurrence on this side of the dividing range. It's also a really important representation of um, box gum grassy woodlands, which are critically endangered all over Australia. Um, so I found this forest really interesting to look at in terms of pest animals because um, impacts of horses have been done quite a lot on wet systems, um, bogs and fens, but not really on dry ecosystems. Um, and in a way, they're really important because dry ecosystems take a lot longer to recover. Um, so yeah, this is in a rain shadow area. You guys are probably familiar. It's just over there. Um, and this is what it looks like. Oops, that one. <laughs> really steep slopes, um, which are really prone to sheet and gully erosion. And the problem with that is as soon as it rains, we get overland flow, which carries sediment down straight into the snowy, and it starts clogging. So looking around into the forest, um, you can see it's in a really degraded state at the moment. Um, here is a uh, root system that's been exposed on a couple hundred year old tree. So here we can see that it used to be um, a solid few centimeters higher than that. So imagine the sheer tonnage of soil that's been lost over hundreds of years um, over this wilderness area. And you can see um, here is some of the sediment that's been caught up against some wiring. Um, same thing with the understory. There's a really obvious lack of understory and midstory. Um, and this is really important because that vegetation is responsible for holding together um, the soil surface and stopping that sediment from flowing down into the river. Um, but this forest did not always look like this. Um, early descriptions of the area um, described it as wide open lush grasslands um, with chocolate soils. So how did we get here and why does it look like this now and why is it so degraded? So um, here is a photo from 1954 just up the river um, in the Injibira. Um, this is uh, yeah, what it looked like. <laughs> degraded, it's a little bit better, but um, it didn't used to look like this. So Ian Pulsford, who's one of my uh, research supervisors, for his master's thesis in 1991, uh, put together a really um, detailed chronology of disturbance in the area. So the first one, uh, which Claire talked about, was um, the removal of the indigenous people. Um, so for thousands of years, they were regularly setting low intensity fires, which maintained an open structure of the woodland. Um, and that was suppressing um, regeneration of trees, keeping it the way it was. So by 1856, the Nagarago people were removed completely from this area and there were no longer these common fires. So the first change in the landscape happened because of the fire regimes. Um, the second thing that happened to disturb this landscape was the cattle and the sheep grazing. So along the Barry Way, along the Snowy River, um, you guys are probably familiar, the cattle used to move from the high country down to Victoria. Um, 
and the Australian vegetation did not evolve to be able to cope with um, the grazing habits and the hooves of these animals moving through. So we lost the vegetation and then in turn uh, we were losing the structure of the soil and ended up looking a bit like this. And the last wave of disturbance was the rabbits that came through in plague proportions um, in about 1900. But by 1974, the whole area was involved into the Kosciuszko National Park and the cattle and the sheep and the rabbits were all removed. So my question was, why is this landscape still so degraded? Um, so to look at this, I have a hypothesis that horses and deer are having an impact. Um, here are some guys that I found along the way. Um, so yeah, my hypothesis for my research was that they were responsible and I wanted to know um, what the impacts were and whether they were. So to do this, um, I uh, used a framework that was developed by one of my supervisors, Richard Thackway. Um, I collected data to looking, looking at the structure, composition and function of the vegetation and as well as the soil functionality. Um, and conveniently for me, um, in 1991, Ian Polsford set up explosions. Um, these explosions were looking at, uh, trying to find out whether rabbits were having an impact, um, but successfully kept out the horses and the deer. So what I've done is I've compared the condition of the inside of the explosions to the outside um, and seen overall what the impacts were. So what did I find? Um, here is a look at what the soil looks like outside. So overall inside the exposures, soil functionality was um, just significantly increased. Um, biological cover was increased, soil surface stability as well as moisture was increased. Um, all these things are responsible for holding together that soil surface and stopping the erosion from running down into the river. Um, and here are some cute little columbula. So these invertebrates are a really good indicator of ecosystem health. Um, you can find up to a thousand of these per square centimeter in, in a healthy ecosystem. But I didn't find those. <laughs> um, looking at the understory, here is a really nice fence line contrast to where the horses are and aren't um, outside, inside. Understory structure, cover, height, structural diversity, and reproductive potential was significantly better where the horses weren't, again, holding together that soil. Um, same thing with the mid-story. This is a really obvious one. Um, structure and diversity was much increased where the horses and the deer aren't. Um, a really important one was a really obvious lack of dead shrubs outside, uh, which provide important uh, habitat and shelter for native birds and lizards. Um, interesting, there was no, here's a photo of the exclosures. You can really see there's a big difference inside and outside. Um, there was no difference within the overstory. Um, we're guessing because these trees grow to a couple hundred years old, 35 years of exposure was not enough for them to regenerate. Um, so the next part of the research was to determine what was um, causing these impacts. So we did some camera trapping and found uh, two species of deer, the fallow deer and the samba deer, um, as well as the horses in the forest. Um, there's also the native macropods, the kangaroos and the wallabies and some possums. Um, but this was just indicative that was telling us what was here, but we wanted to know more about the density of what was here. So we replicated some dung transects, which are an indication of um, herbivore density. So in 1987, you can see that um, rabbits and kangaroos were the main source of dung in the area. Um, but several years later, this year, we found 84% um, and four times as much more dung was by horses in the area. Um, only 1% to 2% was from rabbits and kangaroos. So they're really being pushed out. Um, there is not much happening. <laughs> so... Um, what does that mean for the snowy and for this system? So I can see here via my research that the forest is capable of recovery, although it's going to be very slow. And for it to recover, it really needs to have the removal of these pest animals. Um, if they're still here, they're really responsible for losing that vegetation structure, which holds together the sediment and the soil. And um, yeah. Without it, all the soil's running down into the river, and as you know, it's clogging. And without the flow, we can't take it away. So, um, yeah, that is a brief summary of what I did. <laughs>